Hey there, my name's Crew, and welcome to our YouTube channel today. While you're here, we hope this content does three things. Firstly, helps you discover God. Secondly, help you develop yourself. And thirdly, that'll deploy you into leadership with a biblical worldview. Before you go, make sure you like, share, comment, subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the content. Well, I'm glad to be with you this morning. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about a message that I really feel like the devil's mad at me about, and I don't care. But... There's been a lot that's happened this week and I just sometimes have this feeling like this is really for somebody. And before I get started, I am gonna honor my family. Um, of course, my mom and dad because they are the ultimate leaders for me in legacy. And because of their example, we've been able to, as their children, glean from their wisdom and their walk and apply it to our life. Yesterday was actually me and my husband's seven year anniversary. And yeah, and so you'll see my family back on the back screen. I have two little boys that look like my father, and I'm happy about it. Um, I didn't know you could birth clones, but I did. And so, you know, I, I look at this, and a lot of you guys may look at our family, and you don't necessarily know, just like we don't know all the times with you. Like, we all have a story, and we all have a life, and we all have a walk, and we have things we've been through. But even as I look at those pictures today, I just look at how God's weaved together my life and my story, and how God has a purpose in everything in our lives. And so that leads me to my message title this morning, which is Poised for Purpose. And I like the etymology of words, so I'm always gonna bring you guys that. And I was wondering, like, man, what does poised really mean? And it has really three different things that you can point out. And it's, first thing is to be ready for or to do something, to have a specified weight, or to hang in suspense. I don't really like the last one, but that's a lot of times how our purpose feels, is that it's just hanging in suspense. But the thing I wanna tell you this morning is that we all have this undeniable truth in life that we have an innate power to choose. Each one of us, whether you realize it or not this morning, you have a power that is unique to you to make choices. And whenever you make these choices, they happen through what we think and what we do, and they build into something that's hopefully greater for ourselves and for others. But think about how you choose something every day. It could be small, like you wake up and you choose to brush your teeth, which I hope is a choice for you. It's important. But we make these small choices every day, and it either moves us forward or not. And every choice you're gonna see behind me, I like visuals, it's kind of like a brick. And you're building something either intentional or by default. And, you know, these choices, they build the house of our life. They build what our life looks like. And it's our greater purpose, a greater calling. And, you know, for me, does anyone else out there ever get frustrated at things? I do. I'm a person that deals with a lot of frustrations, probably because I have a lot of expectations on myself and others. But... One of my frustrations, you know, it could, it could be things like you deal with like driving. I don't know why Frisco traffic is insane now. And I specifically target Teslas because they're the worst. <laughs> but, you know, you, you just see one and you avoid it. Um, they self-drive, so I don't know if that's the problem or if it's the driver. They're all tracked to the same car. But, you know, we get frustrated at different things in our life. Like we get frustrated that things aren't happening as fast as we like or the way that we like. And I was thinking about this the other day because I deal with this a lot in my brain of like, come on God, like why isn't it happening now? Like I believe you could do it and do it now, you know, and I get frustrated about it. But I was thinking about this the other day, I was thinking, you know the best things in life and in my life that I love took time to make. They weren't quickly manufactured, they were handcrafted. And I think about my life and I think about the things that I've been through and I, I think about how growing up I would, I would have thoughts like, why don't my brother and sister have to go through what I've been through? Why am I the one? Or, you know, I would look at different things in my family and, and, and look through like our generations and be like, okay, like, and I would compare, which that's not gonna get you anywhere, by the way, I've learned this. It's not gonna help you to do that. But what I have found is that if you understand that you have a choice, you can actually make intentional choices 
with even the things that frustrate you because God has a plan and a purpose and everything he's doing and he's weaving it together. And you're gonna look at like the fabric of your life. Like think about like a coat. You could open that up and look at the stitching and go, wow, that was, that's why that happened. Wow, that's important. And you don't a lot of times see that until you look back. But can you imagine if you tried to build a house without an architect or a plan? I'd be like, yeah, that seems good there. Oh, it's a weight-bearing wall, beam. It's fine. Move it. You know, like, like I sometimes like do girl math and girl hanging of things. Like this last week, I hung some pictures with some thumbtacks. And my husband was like, Keela, that is not gonna work. I was like, believe it or not, I've done this before. Before you, I didn't wanna nail nails into my wall because I knew I would do more destruction. So I did a bunch of these. I don't know if any girls have done that, but I did. And I think through like things like this and I'm like, man, a lot of us are living our life this way. We're trying to build a life and make choices without having a plan, without really thinking through what the end result's gonna be. And I wanted to give you a visual. So you're gonna see these two little buildings. They look like they're standing. But if you really think about it, would these last? I don't know. Like this one has a bunch of random stones all kind of thrown together and they fit and it's like, well, that's fine. But I wanna show you what maybe intentional choices look like. You know, don't you want your life to look like that? Like you look at the bricks, you're like, how did they do that design? How did they place that like that? Like how, how does that work? That's how I want people to be able to look at my life one day and go, how did that happen? How did that work? And a lot of times we negate to realize that our choices matter and they build into something that's gonna affect future generations. You know the enemy doesn't like it when you make the choices that bring you closer to what God has for you. He doesn't like it. He, but he doesn't actually care if you feel God or if you come to church occasionally or if you go up to an altar call or if you sing a song in worship. You know what he cares about? If you start actually really living it. That's what freaks the enemy out. He has these like triggers, okay? And if you're a follower of God, you're already a target, but if you're gonna actually live it, it's gonna be a trigger. And a lot of people in church like to talk about the verses that make us feel good, like God has a plan for you, plans to give you a hope and a future and to prosper you, and he has a purpose for your life. That is so good, but if we don't realize on the other side, that just like God has a purpose for your life, so does the devil. And you're either a part of God's purpose or you're a part of the other one. We like to tell ourselves that there's an in-between option. It makes us feel better because we're like, there's no way I'm following the devil. If you're not following God's purpose for your life, you're following the enemy's purpose for your life. And when you start actually living it, and you stop making excuses and you no longer exempt yourself from showing up and when you stand in the power God gave you and when you don't fear or, or care about like public opinion or what the world thinks about you and you're fueled by faith and not emotions and you submit to God and you stand for God and you stay when you can leave and you let go of your fear and sin and past and your way and you stop making excuses and you take responsibility and you take action on your belief and just instead of saying I'm a believer, we should have a word like, I'm a liver. That's why I like in the Bible, they didn't call themselves Christians. Josh kind of touched on some of this. They called them followers of the way. And when I think through some of this, I think, man, when we live this way, you're the devil's greatest threat. And what happens when you trigger the enemy? He attacks your purpose. He tries to get you to question your importance, your significance, your strength, and your gifts. And if this is happening to you, this should be an indicator that you have power beyond what you even know. The devil knows that if he can get you to question your own God-given power and anointing and purpose, he can sidetrack you from it. Why do you think that so many people deal with this same struggle of feeling loved or for having a purpose or wondering if their life matters? Think about times in your life. Haven't you questioned this at times? You see, the enemy, he tells us all the same things but you have a choice what you believe. He has a message and he's trying to send it to you with the goal of removing you from your purpose. People talk about the lies of the enemy all the time, but you know what kind of messes me up is when he tells me the truth. 
when he tells me like, I'm not enough. But what the enemy fails to include in his version of the truth is that he always misses the power of God in our lives and the freedom we have to walk in that power if we choose to access it. So while I might not be, I might not have enough, I might not be good enough, I might not have what it takes, because of God's power, it's limitless if I just submit to him. So he's gonna tell you the truth a lot of times, but it's gonna be the truth without God. So don't believe the word of the devil over the word of the Lord. God has not designed anything in your life that will take you out. And the enemy has no power that you don't give him. You have everything you need to do what God's called you to do. And you are exactly who God wants to do it with because he's purposed you to do it. The devil is honestly scared of the day that you realize who you are. We all have something that drives us. And our purpose isn't a destination. It's our call to greatness. And it lives beyond us through generations. You know, a year ago, we were in, we started this legacy movement. And I spoke in that uh, series and I, I looked at this definition that I had talked to you about and I wanna remind you of this because legacy thinking is a future-focused way of thinking that connects the mindfulness of the present with the map of the future. We can't just live our life if we actually want our life to mean something. We can't just live our life and go, hope it works out, seems okay, kids will have to deal with it. Like, truthfully, sometimes I like Steve Harvey, but Steve Harvey was talking on this radio show, I like to listen to R&B, it's like my favorite type of music and gospel, it's just my thing. And so I was listening to it the other day and he was saying like, you know, my kids are all upset at me because they want me to apologize, I just need to get over it. Sometimes you need to apologize to your kids. Sometimes you need to take responsibility for the choices you've made and realize the repercussions that it's done to your legacy and then change your direction. Start building something that actually matters. You know, the word legacy, the, just the etymology of that word means people sent on a mission. You know, whenever I look at words like this, I, I, it usually leads me to some other kind of definition because then I was like, what is a mission? Like, what does that mean? Are we missionaries? Like, what does this mean? If you look into that word, it actually connects to a word deputy, which means someone who is appointed or assigned. You are appointed and assigned to be here at this time. And any other message that you've gotten is false. Because God wouldn't have done everything he did to get you here, whether you think it was an accident or not, if he didn't have a purpose for you in this earth. And when you conquer something, you set your kids up and other people following you behind after to conquer that same thing. When you choose to be a person who learns from your life lessons, your kids won't have to relearn those lessons. One of our biggest questions that we have in life is why am I here? Why do you think you see so much confusion in gender, identity, sexuality, like purpose of, of like religion and following whatever? Like I love on a level when people are like, oh, I'm not religious. I'm like, neither am I. Do you know who the Pharisees are? Not religious. We are about having a relationship with God. And guess what we try to do here at the church? We try to give you insights on how to have a good relationship with God. A lot of us are trying to have a good relationship with God and we've never seen a good relationship modeled. We don't have good relationships with our family, our friends, our spouse, anybody, and we expect to have a good relationship with God. The word of God gives you a map to know how to have a relationship with God, how to do your life, and you can push it away, you can reject it, you can say, oh, that's not relevant, that's Old Testament, that's whatever. That's fine, you just won't benefit from it. I've grown up in church and I've seen people leave church because they say, I'm not being fed. And you know what the Bible talks about that too? And it says, I'd love for you to get off the milk and get some meat. We live in a world right now, truthfully, of weak jawed, weak people who just wanna be handed a bottle. You know what happens when you chew meat? It builds your jaw muscles. Some of us need to get stronger. Some of us need to go research. Some of us need to go spend time with God and study and find out the truth for ourselves. So when the enemy brings us a lie, it's not only easy to identify, but you can go, actually, no, hold on. I know what the word says. You're not coming to a church going, feed me, feed me, and when you don't get fed anymore because we have to cut off the bottle at some point because it's gonna degrade your teeth and your palate's gonna be low and like you're gonna, or high palate, and you're gonna have all this stuff, all these issues, it's just medical things, but I'm just saying, you're gonna have these issues in the spirit and you're gonna be like going from church to church to be fed. This is a church where you're gonna get meat. 
This is a church where you're gonna get truth. This is a church where you're gonna be able to have not just peace and hope, but where you can walk in authority because you know who you are. <laughs> Truthfully, we don't need more feel-good churches. We've had, the, we've had the movement of like fire and brimstone church, and then we've had the seeker-sensitive movement that made everybody feel good but didn't get anywhere. We live in a world right now where we need to have the truth so the truth can set us free. And we can't be the people in the church that's always needing to be set free. We gotta go set others free. I wanna read you something. I didn't know if I was gonna do this, but I, I had sent my family this research because I'm always researching random things. The latest research from Public Religion Research Institute found that more than one quarter of Americans now identify as religiously unaffiliated. In fact, unaffiliated is the only religious group seeing growth in the U.S. Even worse, tens of millions of Americans have stopped attending church over the past quarter of a century. The decrease in church attendance is due to many other, like, things that might be happening. But Derek Thompson, a self-identified agnostic, said, Relationship with organized religion provided many things at once. Not only a connection to the divine, but also a historical narrative of identity. A set of rituals to organize a week and a year in a community of families. They found that people actually experiencing this were able to have a community and they were able to instill values in their children. In his conclusion, Thompson doesn't say it outright, but if you read between the lines, it's clear that this guy, who's an agnostic person, says, I wonder if in foregoing organized religion, an isolated country that has discarded an old and proven source of a ritual at a time, but we most need it, it took decades for America to lose religion. It might take decades to understand the entirety of what we lost. So we're sitting here walking away from God, walking away from church, going, that doesn't matter, that doesn't matter. We don't even realize what it's gonna do to families, what it's gonna do to America, what it's gonna do to the world. And this isn't a doom and gloom message. Just wanna say that, because I'm not like into those. This is a message and a challenge to say that you are poised, you have been called to carry the weight of what God's called you to in this season, in this time on earth, in this time in America. Stop giving yourself excuses. You know that that, that means that over 85 million people have stopped believing in God and attending church in the last couple of years. It's interesting how like COVID happened and people were like, ah, I don't need God, it's fine. What? Did you see what happened during COVID? The people that were believers got so scared we wouldn't even go out in public because we forgot who our God was. Like he didn't create our bodies. Like he couldn't protect us. Somehow throughout history, believers lose their identity, and then we see the repercussions, and then we're like, oh God, save us. It doesn't have to be this way. So we have this question of why am I here? We look to the world and to others to somehow answer this question for us, like it's some arbitrary or ever-changing thing. For the world it is, like, who are you today? Like I said, are you a boy, are you a girl, are you this, are you that, are you this person? It's ever-changing, whatever you feel. No, the Bible tells us that when he knew us before we were in our mother's womb and he knit us together, he had a purpose and a plan and a calling for us. The only way that that gets confused is if we misalign our purpose and we start believing the word of the devil over the word of God. Everyone has pivotal moments in your life where your purpose is defined. And the choices that you make in these crucial times, they set the course for the rest of your life and legacy. I wanna tell you today that God designed you for the life that you were called to live. He has a specific weight for you to carry in the kingdom. You know, my dad, he always asked us growing up, what are you contributing to this family? I wanna challenge you with the same thought process, not just in your family, but in your kingdom family. Do you just come here to church and see what you can get? Does someone have to tell you to serve, please, because it's gonna be great for you because of all the benefits in the Bible and like how you should be in a group? Or can you think of yourself as a contributing member of the family because the church is not a building, it is us. And when we come together, you have a part to play in the family. That's your purpose. What is the part that you're playing in the family? Because the part that you play in the family is to not be an infant and be fed with the bottle. Eventually, we've gotta grow up. We've gotta decide, this is what my family's called to do in the earth. This is what I'm called to do in the earth because you have a relationship with God and he reveals these things to you. 
You know, I, I think about this and I think back to how the enemy tried to get us to question who God was and who he made us to be, and we fell for it. It all started in the garden. Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree and they fell for it and they were hiding. And God finds them in Genesis three and he talks to them and he says, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was, just like he knows where we are. Adam, where are you? And he eventually answers and he says, we're hiding because we're naked. I always thought this was interesting because earlier in Genesis two, it says that they were naked and they were not ashamed. So then I started going deeper into this and I realized that there were two different words used for naked. So earlier, it's arom, which means external nakedness to be exposed. And the second part, when they said that they realized that they were naked and they hid was arom, which is internal without the veil. A lot of us are walking through life without the covering of God in our life. And we're frustrated because we're like, why do I keep getting hit? Why do I keep getting attacked? Why do I keep having this happen to me? You're not under the covering of God. You can be a believer, but if you don't act like his child and live like his child, you will, you're, you're literally under a different authority. So what they realized in that moment is we don't have the covering of God. It wasn't that they were physically naked. You know, a lot of believers, they have a problem. They're like, why, what's, what's with the tree? Why did there have to be a bad tree? Why did there have to be bad fruit? There's no bad fruits. God created them all. It was all about a choice. If you didn't have the choice to reject God, you would have never had the chance to choose him. So whenever they had made their decision and they believed what the enemy said, because what the enemy did is he interpreted God when he said, who told you? Well, he said, did God really say Satan said, did God really say? He was having them question the character and the word of God. This, this whole thing sticks out to me because I look at this and I'm like, God knew that Adam was naked. He knew that he had eaten of the fruit because his second question beyond like, who told you that you were naked was, did you eat of the fruit? Which he already knew all this. Why was he doing this? He was trying to get Adam to understand how the enemy works. The last thing we need to do is let the enemy or the world interpret God's word for us and then adopt that viewpoint. Adam and Eve let this happen and they acted on that interpretation and that's exactly what we're seeing in our world today. But your perspective creates your future. And the enemy has always tried to attack the character and the word of God and he's still doing it today. And I look at this and I, I remember this video that I saw where I'm sure you've seen this, they do like these experiments with these groups of people and they're in a room and there's all these chairs. I think I actually did a reaction video on my Instagram to this, but they were asking people, do you think that God is good or that Satan is good? And only one guy in the entire group went and sat down because he believed that God was good, not Satan. And all this group of people are laughing at him and they're like, why would you say that God is good? Satan cares more about people than God. There's all this stuff coming out now, if you don't know this, where Satan, there's like these like cartoons of Satan and he's like, I care about your right to choose. It's like these cartoons. I care about your right to choose. You should have the right to choose an abortion. Now the, now the Church of Satan is partnering with abortion clinics and you can like literally sacrifice your child in a ritual with these abortion clinics that are partnered with them. It's real, go look it up. And people in the world are saying that Satan believes and wants your, your success more than God. Why? Because we don't always like doing it God's way? Because it goes against our flesh? You know, God didn't come to condemn Adam and Eve. He came to cover them. Whenever he found them hiding, he loves them. So he, when he was talking to them about being naked, guess what he did? Even though they didn't need to be ashamed of their nakedness, they were the only people around, guys. He still made clothes for them. He still gives us a chance. We like to blame Adam and Eve for a lot of stuff, but who are you gonna blame when it's not working out in your life? Because we're the same. You know when your perception changes, a lot of times it'll change how you feel about something. Like someone will talk to you about someone and then you meet them and you're like, you're not that bad. I don't know why it's always a negative thing when that happens, but like, we have this perception, right? Like people say things about our church too and then people come and they're like, oh, it was great. You know, and 
don't read Yelp reviews because it's just a place for keyboard warriors. Come live it. But our thinking is what actually changes our direction. So if you can get a different perception from the word of God and understand, you can understand and see your purpose never changed. It was just your perception. God has poised you for purpose. And I wonder if the decisions that we're making right now, God's setting it up for you to see, this is why I have you here. I think of the story of Daniel. We all know this story. He was Jew, a Jewish boy that was taken into captivity by the Babylonians and then Nebuchadnezzar and his friends, like Nebuchadnezzar threw him and his friends in the fire and then he was around and then he served the kings and then he served Nebuchadnezzar's son and then there was another guy that took over named King Darius. There was all these people and Daniel was still somewhere in the ranks of that helping these leaders and he was very valued. And his group of advisors, King Darius, did not like Daniel and they conspired against him and they tricked the king into decreeing that there was a 30 day window during which he, someone should be thrown into a lion's den if they worship anyone but this king. And sounds like entrapment. But you know what Daniel did? He went, he knew the decree, by the, by the way guys, he was like working with the king. He went and go, he goes, I'm not even just gonna pray publicly, I'm gonna do it three times a day by my window so everyone can see. That's boldness. You know, you might actually have to take a stand for what you believe and take action on it at some point. And I look at this story and what happens is God shuts the lion's mouths. They used to like starve these lions so that they would eat people when they put them down there. That was the point. But the king was so distraught by this decree and he couldn't go to sleep because he liked Daniel and he couldn't change the law. And so what happened is the king rushes there in the morning and they open up the, the den and he comes out and he's like, you're alive. And he's like, yeah, God shut their mouths. I don't know if you knew this, but he was 80 at the time, around 80 at the time. So I look at that and I go, he wasn't like fighting off any other lions, right? This is a picture of it's never too early or never too late for God to show you your purpose. And guess what happened to his accusers? The king took them, their wives, and their children and threw them in the lion's den. The Bible actually details this and says they didn't even reach the floor before the lions ate them. Daniel's consistent choices and commitment to honor God reinforced his purpose and revealed God to his leaders and entire nations of people. We reveal God to others through our life. In Isaiah 43, 10, it says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. The word witness means to see or know by personal presence or to observe. When you look at this word witness, it's connected to a word in the meaning of it. I don't really like this word, to be honest, but it's martyr. But martyr means one who bears testimony to faith no matter the cost. Do you know that every single disciple of Jesus, except for John, was tortured to death? And they said that they were happy to do that, to continue to be faithful to God. Most of us can't even get up to come to 9 a.m. It's an inconvenience because my favorite team's playing. Don't wanna go to 11 a.m. because it might run long. What? Like, this is real. And some of us have these feelings. Some of us are like, nah, it's not really convenient for me to give to God. Okay, I guess since you're not gonna like live according to his life, like Pastor Keith said, don't expect for him to show up when you need him, even though I'll tell you he will. But all I'm saying is that you have a chance and a choice to walk in the purpose and the covering of God and every single day, you're either being a witness to that or not. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, it says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I just wanna preface this because it says in the last days, We've been in the last days since Jesus ended. So when Christians are always like, it's horrible, he's coming soon. They've been saying that ever since he went. It says in the Bible, you'll not know the time or the hour. So just live it now. Stop waiting for, oh, Jesus, come back. I remember growing up in the church, I'd be like, God, no, I wanna get married first. 
for obvious reasons. And I was like, please God. (laughs) But some of us are living our lives waiting for something like that to come through and God's waiting on us to get with the program and be a part of what he has for us right now. You know, I look at what's happening in America and in the world and it sounds really familiar to this verse. But in times of darkness, God's power shines bright. The darker the night, the brighter the light can be seen. In Isaiah 60, one through two, it says, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and the deep darkness of the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. This makes me think of the story of David. A lot of us know this story in 1 Samuel 17. I think about the scene of what it must have felt like as a 13 to 15 year old, however old he was, hearing Goliath yell and insult and curse out the army. He's walking in there and guess what he's doing? He's stepping into his purpose. He may not have connected it all, his preparation, all the time that he spent, but when the moment came, his preparation was his relationship with God and the faith that he had because of that relationship. He had practiced it. Daniel's preparation, David's preparation, and our preparation is all the same. How will you respond to the pivotal moments that lay ahead in your life? It depends on the preparations you allow God to make and your willingness to step forward in faith and trust him. You know, a lot of times when we can't see the purpose in something and our perspective's off, we say things like, if I just knew when it would happen, who I would marry, how much money I would get, if it would work out, that doesn't require any faith. Trust should not be dependent on you getting what you want when you want it. Don't expect God's preparation to look like your purpose. Your preparation often seems useless but God wants to use it to shape your perspective so you can win in the future. I think of this man named Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. He was a doctor. He was in concentration camps during World War II. And he came up with this form of therapy to help individuals find purpose in any situation and ultimately choose how to cope with their suffering. It was called logotherapy. And logos means meaning. So it was therapy to help you find meaning. The greatest lesson lesson of this was really truly understanding that you have the power of choice. An individual who goes through horrific experiences can choose to still have a positive attitude. People say that moments determine the trajectory of our lives, but logotherapy would say, and the Bible would say, that how we respond to moments determines how they unfold. This idea shows us that individuals are always free to choose a positive attitude, even when the worst conditions. You can see this quote behind me. It says, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. We naturally live our lives based on feelings, not faith. And we wonder why we're like worried and depressed and facing anxiety or fear. But if circumstances or feelings control your life, you will also just be so focused on what's happening around you that you'll never pay attention to what God can do through you. I wanna show you a visual of golden pyrite, which is known as fool's gold. A lot of you guys have maybe seen this before, but as I was researching this, I found that pyrite is actually formed through this reaction of bacteria that reduces sulfate ions. And basically what happens is iron sulfate causes these crystals to begin to grow, but it's really caused by like a bacteria. Whenever I found out about gold, I honestly couldn't even believe it. I don't know if you know how gold's formed, like it just maybe showed up on the earth, maybe you thought it formed underneath, but no. What happens is that gravity causes a star to collapse and gold is formed through the collapse, an explosion that sends a massive shock wave. And this amount of energy creates these heavy elements that go through this rapid neutron capture process. And these heavy elements are transported through space to their destination and become the beginning of formations of new stars or planetary systems. When this star explodes, these heavy elements make their way to earth and gold is formed. So you have fool's gold that's created through bacteria, nastiness basically, and then you have this one where a star explodes and then it's like, oh, gold. Like, think of a cartoon, you know? A lot of people's life looks okay, but it's really been formed by a lot of dysfunction and stuff that's not good. 
And some of us as believers, we want to discount when we go through hard things because we're like, God, how can you use this? If he can make gold out of an explosion of a star, I'm pretty sure he can do something with your life and your situation. And it's one of the most precious metals that you could even find. Some of us, we couldn't even tell the difference in these if we looked at them. But do you know how they actually did this and how they still do it today? is through this thing called an acid test. They take nitric or hydrochloric acid and they use this to test the validity of gold. They submerse them in this and it dissolves very quickly, but the stronger the acid, the gold withstands, the purer it is. So they put it in acid, it either dissolves or not. Back in the Bible times, they actually used fire as a refining process and they would, they would do this with gold because it would take all the impurities to the surface so they could be removed. Some of us are living a life right now and we think it looks okay, but deep down we know it's not. We're like scratching the surface, we're making it, we're making other people think we're okay. But the truth is we haven't given God our situations, our problems, our life. We're not really truly following. We might believe in him. That doesn't mean you're following him. And I, I, I look at something like this, and in 1 Peter 1, 7, it says, your faith will be like gold that has been tested in fire. We don't have a promise in this fallen world that we won't go through anything. Unfortunately, if you're alive, you're gonna go through something. The promise that we have is that we don't have to do it alone, and we don't have to actually create meaning or purpose in what we're going through. God does that. What I've learned early in my life, I think it was around middle school, not middle school, but like high school, college, because I'm like a really private person, I, I know you see my brother and my sister and they're introverts, but like they're a lot better at me than doing certain things like being in public things, certain things like that. But I have a tendency to withhold. I have a tendency to shut down. And I had been through things like abuse or rejection or loss or, or health stuff. And there were so many different little things that I went through and I would just push it down, push it down, push it down. And I spent like a lot of time with God in that season and God showed me that whatever you keep in the dark, the enemy has authority over. But whatever you bring to light, God can use as a weapon against the enemy and to help others. And I think in our life, like what are you keeping in the dark right now? What is it that you think is useless or doesn't have a point that if you just gave it to God would be a weapon? You know, the Bible is an acid test for the world and everything in it that tries to set itself up against the truth of God. Some of us need to start, to start looking at what God says about it instead of what the world or our friends or we think about it. And use the Bible and the word of God and the truth of God to actually live our life. Job 23.10 says, but he knows the way I take and when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. God's gonna do something amazing with your life. You've been poised for purpose. And I wanna show you something through the story of Ruth and Orpah. Ruth and Orpah were Naomi's daughter-in-laws and their husbands died and Orpah chose to return back to her homeland and Ruth stayed with Naomi, found her husband, Boaz, and Orpah married someone back home. They both had a choice and this choice birthed things that we may not even realize. You see, behind me what you'll notice is Orpah became the mother of Goliath and Ruth was the great-grandmother of David. Goliath was about 40 when David was about 13 to 15 when the battles happened. And I look at this and I just think, your alignment and your agreement will birth something that you could never plan for. But it's doing, something's happening. Through every choice that you're making, everything that you're building in your life, something's happening. It's either for the purpose that the enemy has or it's for God's purpose. Interesting to note here, 28 generations after David, Jesus was born through Mary's bloodline, which ultimately came through Ruth's choice to honor God and follow her God-given purpose. You were created to live a life that tells a story of God's faithfulness. He knows the start, he knows the end, and we all have a chance and a choice to be a part of the great things that he's doing in the world. You may never know on this side of eternity what the return was, but God's the one that works it all together. God wants to take what you come from, where you've been, and who you are, and use it all for his kingdom to set up future generations to win. The great thing about submitting to God is you don't have to figure it all out. 
I look at these stories and in Mo, with Moses in Exodus 19, 16. It says, before this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed through all the earth. Esther in Esther 4, 14, for such a time as this you were born, David called out of the fields into battle and eventually king. Daniel taken from his home to change the world through faithfulness. Ruth lost her husband, found a man whose alignment and lineage led and made a way for Jesus. Ultimately, you get to choose how you see God, life, and you get to choose what you're able to do with your purpose. God will prepare you for whatever he has poised you to do. It's your choice that unlocks his power in your life. I show you these stories and I tell you about these instances because sometimes we can get so disconnected from the Bible and we think they're like fictional stories. These were real people. Like history has proven that actually the more they look into it, the more it's proven. Historians actually look to the Bible to reference other his, historic documents. You know, it's interesting, like, whenever you think through this, that God has been, has been, like, ordaining purpose inside of humans ever since Adam and Eve. And he's never stopped weaving it together intricately by hand, even to today, where we now, as Gentiles, if you're not Jewish in here, can be a part of it. And I think through this, and, and it relates to you because up until this point, you've lived a life, you've had hurt, you've had pain, you've had rejection, you've had questions. And in church, sometimes you feel like you can't ask questions, but how are you supposed to get to know someone if you don't ask questions? Please ask God questions. Please ask questions about God. Because that's how you learn. It's so important in today's world that we don't just come and attend a church. Because guess what? Just as easily as you think that is, you'll leave. It's not even about church attendance though. That's why I want you to understand because if the enemy can get you out of agreement with other believers, the Bible tells us that where two or more are gathered together in his name, it shall be done. There is something to agreement. Don't let how the world tries to define something or convince you of something change what you're doing. Look to what the Bible says. Like I always, I know Pastor Keith referenced it. I don't know if it was first or second service, but he was like, we believe in women speakers. There's a thing in church that people say they don't believe in women speaking. They've never read the Bible. They've read it out of context because the first disciple was a woman. God used women as judges, as prophets. He picked Mary to be birthed through. If you don't think that women are important, understand that women are the only thing that God made by hand. He's the only one that, that we're the only ones he touched. Men are just as important, if not honestly more sometimes because I like to think of it as a structure. You are the spine, you're the skeleton. If the skeleton isn't in frame, none of the rest of the body works. Right now what you're seeing in culture, and it makes me emotional because I hate it. <laughs> you're seeing a structure out of order where women are having to stand up and bring their families to church and men are looking for some greater calling and purpose when it's right here in the kingdom. The greatest purpose and the greatest calling that you're ever gonna have is through God because he made you. And anything else is fake and it's not gonna last and you're gonna keep searching. We work together. The Bible talks about in, in Peter that we are equal heirs. And while the Bible talks about one being a weaker vessel, that word is physically weaker vessel. We need men to protect us and to stand up and to speak up. Don't think in this world today that we live in that you living for God is in vain. A lot of people will think like, what can I do? I'm not like an Esther, I'm not like a Moses, I'm not like whatever. You do what you can to be faithful. You know, people say simple things because we have such a jacked up system right now, even with voting or whatever. They're like, it doesn't even matter. I'm not gonna do anything. Well, then you're gonna get the fruits of what that looks like for your family and for your city and for your nation. And I'm not gonna stand for it. Like this is too, this is too big of a deal. And I know, I know in church, People get weird when you talk about things that aren't in the Bible, but let me tell you, it's all through the Bible. You see where God reached rulers through believers. Where are you reaching rulers? Where are you changing your cities? You have an opportunity here. You have, a, you have an opportunity to contribute to the kingdom here. I had this conversation with my dad like a couple months ago and he was saying like, 
You know, men, we want to build these monuments that last beyond us. And I was like, I feel the same way about my kids. I want to build them so that they last beyond me. You need to care enough to do something. Don't just live in your bubble, go to work, have a marriage, have kids, and wonder what happened. You have a part to play, and I want to pray for you. Maybe today you're in a great season, maybe you're not, but today I want to give you a chance to move on something because God has called us all to a great purpose, every single person. I don't care what anybody's told you. I don't care, I don't care what it's looked like before this, what choices you've made. And I wanna pray for you and I wanna challenge you. I'm not gonna like count. I'll tell you when it's gonna happen, but I'm not gonna count. But what I'm gonna believe that as you stand up, because what I'm gonna pray for is that if you wanna walk in God's purpose like never before, with almost like blinders on, I think of a horse, they can only see like this way really, you know, to a certain point. So they put blinders on so they can focus. Put blinders on in this world of what's most important, of what matters most, not what the news says, not what social media says, not what your friends say, not what you feel, and live your life faithfully to God. That will change the world around you. If you wanna be that type of person that says, I'm gonna stand in my purpose like never before, I want you to stand up. And the reason why I want you to stand up right now is because what you're doing is the enemy doesn't always know what we're thinking. He cannot read your mind, but he sees what you do. And what you're doing is you're making a statement today to say, you can't have me, you can't have my family, you can't have my heart, you can't have my mind, you can't have my health. The Bible talks about that we don't have to defeat the enemy. All we have to do is resist him and God takes care of it. So right now you standing, you're resisting him. You're resisting generational curses. You're resisting anything that someone spoke over you. You're resisting things that you believed about yourself. And I stand here today as someone who's been through some stuff. But just like Daniel's friends and the Bible says in those verses, I wanted to come out of the fire not smelling like smoke because God was with me and God is with you. So God, I thank you today for the people that are standing. God, I thank you that you have a purpose and a plan for them, that you have poised them for purpose. God, I thank you that in today's world, we would not look to the right or the left for purpose. We would not look for someone to approve of us because God, you have already created us exactly for who we are right now in this earth. God, you have equipped us. We are exactly who you need in the earth. So God, I just speak that we would no longer make decisions out of fear, that we would no longer back up and make excuses for ourselves or for our family or for anything else, but God, we would take a stand that we would take action, that you would give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding, divine favor with you and divine favor with men. And God, I even intentionally wore a sword around my neck as a representation today. Because when we carry the word of God with us, it's a weapon against any principalities of darkness. We have power. God, and I pray that these people would never forget that when they feel hopeless, God, they can access your power. It says in the Bible, that your power is made perfect in our weakness so when we feel weak, we can know we still have a choice. God, I thank you that as we walk out of this place, this wouldn't just be a message that we're like, well, that was good, but that today we would apply it, we would live it, we would remind ourselves of the decision that we made of what we're asking, of what we're believing, of what we're standing for. And when hard times come, God, we know that hard times not only don't last, but God, you, you say in the Bible that we win. So whatever that looks like in the preparation on the way there, God, we're in it. We're, we're for you. We're going to stand. And in Jesus' name, God, we're going to see you do something incredible through our lives, through our families, and through our legacies. In Jesus' name. Y'all give my Keela a big hand. Come on. Thank God for the word. So glad that you came to the house of the Lord today. Thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. If that message, if that content helped you elevate your life in any way, make sure you share it with someone today. Before you go, make sure you like, share, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you next time on our YouTube channel.